Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and welcome to Protest and Promise. Today is a very special day because we don't have any of the council members or any of the civic leaders of Los Angeles here to answer questions. It's actually going to be my opportunity to ask questions of young Angelinos that care passionately about the world they're living in and care passionately about how problems are being solved across Los Angeles. So I'm delighted to introduce to you, Alex, nice to see you. Dominique, welcome, we're delighted to have you with us. Bridget, it's so nice to have you back, thanks so much. Nicholas, good to see you. And of course, Richard, how are you doing? Good, good, good. All right, well, you know what? I'm actually going to uh, ask Bridget uh, my question first because Bridget's been with us a few times and she's had the opportunity to listen to council members speak as well as medical advisors, et cetera. So Bridget, how has this experience been for you, hearing how your civic leaders operate? Has it made any impact on you? Have you learned anything? Um, I think for what I've learned is that um, we're, it's like we finally have, well, I finally have an opportunity to talk about politics out loud. It's usually like over like comments on the internet or like, trying to educate um, people around me. And so it's a different um, hearing other people's opinions for once. Yeah, it's interesting. Richard, have you noticed anything about uh, who you've listened to and who you've, I mean, was were there any surprises when you had a chance and, and who impacted you when you had uh, an opportunity to participate? Um, I would say I've had um, just a lot of frustration because it seems like a lot of my views are not really uh, shared among most commentators, but um, I have seen probably the people that are the closest to me, like um, I find on podcasts, like uh, Yaron Brook and a lot of other intellectuals who've been talking about this. Um, there's been obviously a lot in the news, so it would be hard to like, you know, break that down, but well, when you were with us on Protest and Promise, I mean, you know, you had an opportunity to to share your views. Did you feel as if you were heard? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, like I'm sure a lot of, you know, everyone else on would be able to relate in that, you know, a lot of older people tend to just kind of, like my parents even, family members, um, just kind of dismiss it as like, okay, well, I know better because I'm older than you. Mm. So... There's a lot of that going on. Well, I hope that that's going to change because I think what I've learned experiencing all of this uh, with all of you is that you have powerful opinions and you're also making sure that you're very educated in that regard, which allows me to sort of, uh, you know, toss to a couple of our new folks. Alex, where do you stand in the world of knowing about civic leadership and how your future will be in terms of what you can do to direct it? Well, the way that I am approaching civics is primarily from a grassroots level. I've been involved in several grassroots campaigns and on the ground activist organizations. And although I do participate, uh, as I've mentioned previously in politics, where it's much more higher in terms of, um, you know, with elected officials, um, I kind of try to balance both from a grassroots and just higher policy um, level. So I try to balance those two. Dominique, why are you with us today? What was it that appealed to you that you wanted to say? Um, so earlier today, I had gotten a message from Bridget. She had um, sent me a video and I had watched a little bit of it. It was very interesting. and. Um, as I read her message, she told me to email and just search a little bit about it. And it was really intriguing. And I just haven't really gotten 
like an opportunity to speak my word and social media right now is very hectic everyone has their own views and it's very hard to get your view out without um someone trying to alter it and like having your word um not shut down but um change to for them to see the way you see so doing this would be a really good opportunity for me to start um, sticking to my word and standing down and doing what I believe in. So, Well, we're delighted to have you with us. Nicholas, you've been with us too. How has your experience been? What have you thought about the opportunity to share your viewpoint with uh, people in authority as well as your, your, your fellow young Angelinos? Um, I thought the opportunity was actually pretty fantastic. I think the first time that I was on, I think it was the second episode. Um, it was, it was, it was very kind of enlightening to get a chance to see what people would say to each other when face to face, as opposed to online. I think Dominique really touched on like an interesting point is like when discussions debate happens online, it's easy for people to kind of take positions and stances that are, you know, pretty hyperbolic, sometimes kind of hard to imagine those working out practically because it's, you know, it's, it's an online discussion. It all seems very kind of like ethereal when you're actually talking face to face with people that you know kind of are real people that have real opinions you have to respect those opinions no matter how much you disagree with them because you know that's a real person in front of you talking and it's been you know fantastic to kind of be able to talk to people in that way because it sometimes kind of cuts through some of like the kind of like the online kind of like madness and noise that's happening now when people can just kind of throw out positions and throw out stances and a lot of times that kind of bogs down discussion from actually talking about like tangible solutions moving forward that everybody has to take part in sure i mean it, it as you said it's not just you know somebody's screen name it's actually a person that has a real life and speaking of real lives let's talk about what is uh concerning everybody right now um we had tumultuous start to this year with the virus and, and issues with schools, and that's about to start up again. And then added to that, all of the protests surrounding civil rights, racism, and the death of George Floyd, that seemed to really uh, you know, garner a lot of people stepping forward that may not have done things in the past. But where are we now? What are the major concerns for all of you? You all come from different points of view. You all have different stages in your life that you're dealing with, and we're all in different spaces. So, Alex, where are you, and what are the things that are really of concern to you right now? Well, some of the things that I'm concerned about, um, specifically with our current institutions that we look up to, um, a lot of these same institutions are giving us reasons to kind of question some of the actions that they have taken. But I also believe that um, we're, it's in distrusting these institutions, we do also put the danger of having people take advantage of those disagreements. Um, and in order to kind of build trust between community and government and the state, we have to find concrete solutions rather than kind of just shouting at each other. That's one of my concerns, which is that, you know, I'm, I'm for reform, um, but you know, it has to be tangible, I think, to some extent. Well, you're taking a very bold move because I know that you want to enter into the realm of politics. So where do you think, do you think change is happening? Do you think this is a good time to enter into politics? Do you think that right now, um, it needs energy. Do you think it's going to be status quo, waiting for things to sort of pass, the storm to pass? I mean, why are you even thinking that politics is a realm that you want to be in? Well, um, understandably, I know that everywhere politics is around us, from the food that we eat, you know, we know that our food is safe because there's an agency out there that regulates that food. So um, being aware of just these things, um, helps me but I do believe it's a fruitful time to be in politics because it's all over social media um, you see it on the news but not just from established groups and organizations um, but you see it in, in grassroots level support too you're seeing all these civic organizations come up rise up take up the challenge of 
putting pressure on our elected leaders. So I, I do think that it's a, a great opportunity for people to become engaged in the political process. Richard, where are you in your world? What are the things that are the most important to you right now? And have things altered in the last few weeks, few months? Um, do you still have the same passions you had? And what is prominently important to you? Yeah, um, I'd say I still have the same passions and interests as a couple months ago. Um, I'm a little bit uh, disheartened because of the past couple months events, but I would say that I'm still, you know, dedicated to obviously law school and, you know, my future and also making sure that I am able to use that degree to further justice. Are you disheartened because of COVID? Or are you disheartened because of the way government is responding to the protests? When, when you say you're disheartened, is it just that the world is not improving in your mind's eye or uh, we're just sort of, you know, what's going on? All of the above. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely getting worse. Um, it seems like a lot of the cultural trends and political trends are going in the wrong direction. Um, just the way that people are even responding to it, the way that people are consuming their media, it's not really seeming like people are even interested in truth. And so if you can't agree on a set of facts, then there's really not a whole lot you can do in terms of discussing what to do about those facts. So. And what's going to happen with law school, by the way? How is that working out for you? How is it all going to be online? Is it what's going on? We'll see. Uh, there's definitely going to be at least some courses online, um, according to the university. Uh, they said that they're going to do as many in person as possible with social distancing measures and things like that. But it seems like they're proceeding as close to normal as possible given the circumstances. You know, something Richard said, if we can't agree on the basics, I think that that's a really interesting point. So Nicholas, when you're in a position in which, you know, you're trying to start your life, you're uh, trying to launch a career, you know, move forward. How do you feel about that whole idea of if we can't agree on the basics? I think that is an incredibly kind of salient issue as, as, as was brought up by, by Richard and that I, one of the big kind of like one of the final kind of big projects that I actually ended up doing in school was, was focusing on a topic that started to become more and more agreed upon as existing called truth decay, where Americans at increasing numbers can't agree on basic facts about politics, social life, et cetera. And as a result, that undercuts kind of any discussion or debate that people want to have because both sides in a debate might come to the table with entirely separate facts on the same issue and nobody can agree on the common ground so you end up just debating those facts before you start debating the solutions and there's been a bunch of studies that have started to come out especially ones done i know that was very prominent by the rand corporation about how americans like are astronomically due to the internet and kind of the, like the, the issues that causes are like at astronomical levels disagreeing on basic facts, which makes it impossible to have discussions. And I've noticed that, you know, quite a bit kind of coming out of, you know, the end of university into the modern day, every discussion seems to be, I guess, like there's a prerequisite of having to be like, okay, can we establish that we all agree at least on the basics before we have this discussion? Because so many times you'll get you know, deep into like a discussion about something and realize that the two of you are citing two entirely different statistics on the same issue. Okay, so. And it becomes a problem. How about a little example on that? I mean, because Richard's agreeing with you there. So let's, you know, the whole issue of what is a fact, what is fake, what is it? So let's just, let's just toss out, what do you consider to be an, un, you know, this is the truth. This is a fact. You can't argue it. I think one thing, for example, I know recently there were there were different kind of um, reports that came out that talked about the level in which um, Twitter, for example, has been has been infiltrated by bots that are basically entirely like non-human, like basically accounts that like will just be posting stuff and reposting things. And that this has almost become, if I don't, if I'm mistaken, like the majority of tweets actually on Twitter, kind of coming to the table and saying like, hey those bots exist and they play a large role, I think would be considered something that could be factual because those bots do boost numbers. They play a large role because they're there. By nature of them existing on Twitter have to play a large role, but then you could like disagree on, 
for example, have those bots influenced politics to a degree that like, you know, one person says a little bit, one person says a lot, but agreeing even at the start that they are existing in our issue. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some people would come to the table and entirely deny that they, you know, exist to a relevant degree, which just, you know, Twitter, them like themselves, the company have, have said that they do exist. So it's hard to kind of disagree with that. Bridget, do you find yourself in a position in which you're having to argue with friends over uh, different topics these days? I mean, obviously, we're talking about the opportunity to have face-to-face -face interaction. We're talking about what happens when you're on online in situation. But what about with the people that you encounter? Are you are are people talking more to each other and debating things? And what are the things that they're worried about in your world? Uh, well, just recently, I've been um, spending a lot of time on the political side of um, apps, the conservatives and the and the liberals and the leftists all have their own views. And, you know, at some point they're arguing and fighting and they're screaming statistics at each other like through a screen. And I think just knowing that people are um, naive and biased uh, with everything, it kind of just like opens my mind to, to like, different aspects of like people's like political views it's like it's hard to put into words um how most people think people that aren't you people that don't have your beliefs and just doing your own research is very important you know you bring up an interesting point i mean obviously we all grew up with the idea don't believe everything you read you read so where are you getting your information? Where, where are your trusted sources and why are they trusted? I'm gonna go ahead and ask Richard, where are your sources? You're obviously well researched and you care enough to take the time. So where are your sources and why are they secure for you? Thanks, I mean, I, I generally like a basket of different like sort of, I think of as, I mean, yeah, they might be slanted somewhat, but the facts, contained in the article are accurate, which I would say is like Wall Street Journal, um, the New York Times, uh, maybe CNN, the LA Times, um, and Bloomberg. And then I kind of like filter that through, okay, like obviously the way that they're presenting these facts and statistics might have a slight skew, but like I think that the data in there is accurate and they usually link to studies and things like that. And then, you know, I like to get the commentary perspective from both major sides too. Alex, where is, what are your trusted sources? Um, so I, of the things that I listen to come from various outlets, not only just established outlets, like maybe CNN or MSNBC, but also on the ground from like Twitter, social media sometimes. Um, it's something that, um, one of our history professors taught us was is that um, during the Great Depression, you had various um, coalitions of people that would distribute information that were on the ground, grassroots kind of information sharing. So I also take up that philosophy when I look for information. Nicholas, who are your go-tos? Um, one of the things that I've been kind of like, I guess, looking at recently is uh, getting like a lot of information as well from like international like news sources looking into problems at the U.S. Because I think sometimes, you know, different sources like for example like CNN or Fox, which clearly have a political tilt to them, sometimes like obviously like getting information from them and seeing what each kind of side of the spectrum has to say, I think is important to see kind of how they're interpreting the facts. But a lot of times for some basics, I'll look like for example like Associated Press, Reuters, um, like BBC for a lot of information. But one of the things that I, I guess I've been cautious about in terms of social media is how or how much kind of like, uh, I don't want to say kind of like mob rule of information sometimes goes into influence what articles are talked about and what is shared. Because sometimes obviously Twitter or social media like sometimes can speak for like a minority of an opinion. Like for example, like the far right has a Twitter sphere, the far left has a Twitter sphere. And because they can share and repost, those voices become sometimes like outsized in terms of their place in like on the informational spectrum. And you know, something might get retweeted 30,000 times. But when you look at how many people 30,000 actually is, 
that's quite a small number when it comes to not just, for example, let's say like even LA, but the American kind of like debate sphere as well. And so at least, and this isn't, this isn't meant to, to bash anybody who does look at Twitter because I think it does do a good job of getting people current issues very quickly because it's what people, people are experiencing. And so kind of like, for example, when like the George Floyd riots started, Twitter was one of the best places to kind of get real-time updates as to what was happening much faster than the news could possibly share. But once an issue becomes established and like peer-reviewed news has started to look at it, a lot of times I'll pull back from social media because the debate happens, as we talked about earlier, in a strange, ethereal kind of like space where sometimes the facts and like the things can get like skewed based on people sitting behind their screens talking about it. Well, and I think probably something, and I should never interject, but there is a monetary benefit to people on Twitter that doesn't necessarily apply itself to reliable news sources that are there to actually, you know, be the dissemination of information. So, you know, keeping that in mind, um, I was wondering, Dominique, what do you pay attention to? I mean, your life is, you know, you're very young, you're on the cusp of a lot of exciting things, you've got some very practical concerns with, you know, where you're going to be in school, etc. But when you're trying to find out what's happening out in the world and how it's going to impact you, what's your resource? I look for smaller, more, um, they're not well known, less politically biased. And they're, when you go on social media, there's a lot of um, distractions in a way. There are a lot of people with their own opinions. And when I look for information, I go more to people themselves with um, multiple sides to the story. Online, there are people with real stories. They're telling their real... Um, their personal lives. Right. Yes, their personal lives. And having that being that is overpowered by the news and right. having because the news they don't really like to admit but it's really um negative or they're putting a lot of um what they think is the problem right with the protest they were showing a lot of the rioting a lot of the looting when in reality that was a very small portion of what was going on. There were multiple peace protests. There were multiple people just standing outside with the sign and holding their family's hand and just wanting to have a um, solution when they're being ignored. Right. And those are the people that I look at. Right. More than, and you know, um, you're going to bring up a good point. And, and this is kind of how we're going to wrap it up, I think. And believe me, we could do this all day, every day, because you guys are, are so cutting edge on this. But... The protests was such a huge amount of energy that fed into every corner of our life for a period in time. Where is that energy now? Are the protests still as, uh, did they make an impact? And we'll start with Nicholas and then we'll go around. What do you think? I think one of the, one of the problems I think that kind of comes with a lot of social media activism is how quickly information sometimes can actually get out to people. It's a double-edged sword of, I think a lot of people, I want to say didn't, who may not have been the most educated, didn't pace themselves, uneducated themselves on an issue or kind of coming into their own as to saying, hey, I may not know that much about this. I would like to take a couple of weeks or I'd like to take two or three days to learn about the statistics, learn about the facts and kind of come to the table in an informed discussion. But so many people I know instantly started posting things statistic after statistic but then a lot of times they walked back on or they deleted their posts because it was revealed like days or weeks later that oh that actually didn't do much to help and in such a rush to have your voice heard a lot of people's like toes and their feelings and their experiences and like individual kind of lives were stepped on like i know famously people posting like the the all black square on their social media was like meant to be kind of like oh we're going to black up social media to see that we all care however a lot of people then to the incorrect hashtags and it actually buried as dominique said legitimate resources incredibly deep kind of in people's feeds because everybody just posted the thing and so i think 
one of the problems right now that a lot of people are talking about is that the momentum for a lot of people on social exactly. media to talk about things is dying right. like very quickly. Like, there are still people out in the streets protesting, but people's, I, I want to say like it being a fashionable issue on social media because social media is about fashion and about trends. It's not as trendy, unfortunately, to a lot of people on social media, which is sad because it's a human rights issue. It's human rights issues a lot of times have been boiled down to like, how long can we keep a trend going on social media? And unfortunately, a lot of people I think have, star- have started to lose like inter- internet attention to it, which is hard to see. We still see people out in the streets legitimately still physically protesting. What do you think, Richard? Do you think the momentum is over? Do you think that because it's not necessarily trending that it has uh, that it's lost its resonance? Or do you think that this is something that we're going to continue because it's imperative that we do make change in this area? I think one of the biggest problems with the protest movement from the very beginning was that it got bound up in a lot of other issues that weren't focusing on the issue of police brutality and the war on drugs leading to a lot of these issues in particularly our cities. Um, when it comes to, you know, going into the weeds about like a lot of people who have been identified as leading figures in the movement openly saying that they're Marxists and that they want to overthrow capitalism, you alienate a ton of people who would look at it and say, I think it's like 56% of Americans say that there are disparities in police outcomes. But I would be willing to bet that a large portion of that 56% includes people who were maybe even in Rust Belt states who might not have ever seen a black person in their life who would be willing to get on board with saying, yeah, that you know what we're seeing, these videos that we're seeing of police brutality are obviously problematic, let's address this. But at the same time, I don't know if I want to be on board with a movement that's saying all this other wacky stuff. So being focused is really important with any big movement, especially one like this. What do you think, Bridget? Do you think it still has the uh, impact that it intended? Do you think it still resonates with you and those around you? I think it definitely still resonates with me. Um, Especially since like, Back in 2018, I used to attend protests all the time. And as soon as I said, I'm going to go to a protest for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, I was, I was called ignorant and stupid. And it's a dangerous situation. Don't go. But, but I've been going to protests by myself for years. So it's like, where did, where did this energy, bad energy come from? Like it came from like a few looters and and a few bad people that just went to riot and to destroy things for no reason. Well, I can't wait to talk to you all again. I certainly hope that the world treats you uh, well, and I can't thank you enough. So Alex, Dominique, Bridget, Nicholas, Richard, it was great to see you all. Be safe, be well, and we'll talk soon, okay? Thank Thank you. you. And that's a wrap on this edition of protest and promise.